Well, brethren, I want to speak on something this afternoon that we have talked about before, but I love you, and I love many people out there, and I know many get it mixed up, and they don't seem to understand something that's been explained before, and because I come from Missouri, and I try to tell it like it is and make things very plain, sometimes not just in a totally academic way, but going beyond that, I want to cover this. Because frankly, it's talking about a point of history, when you understand it, that's going to be one of the biggest historical events in the history of the entire world from the time of Adam and Eve on, a massive thing. And it's not good in your own understanding to play that down or to misapprehend it. So I hope that all you brethren will try to take notes. I hope all of you brethren, those of you listening in over in Perth, Australia, or you know Sydney, wherever it is, and in Johannesburg and, and Cape Town and around Europe and Britain and everywhere, will listen and try to prove this thing to yourself with an open mind. I'm asking you to do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I've tried to serve you for over 61 years in the work of God, and I've tried to serve you in building this work for over 20 years in the living global living church of God, this is not the most important thing, but it is important. And some seem to have a chip on their shoulder about it, and I'm asking you to get your chip off your shoulder, open your minds, open your hearts, and be willing to listen to the truth. I thought and prayed about this for a couple of years. I know that Mr. Ames has. He's given me some good pointers on it in the past. Dr. Winnale is the one that really helped us get going on it in the first place. It's something we've always partly understood, but not fully understood as we should. And I want you to realize the, the importance of it because this huge, massive event is already beginning to happen and is going to affect the lives of every one of you. All of you know that even our president said a while back, whatever America once was, it is not now. We're not a Protestant nation. We're not a Jewish nation. We're not a Christian nation, he said. He also said he thinks it's just fine for men to marry men and women to marry women. Hillary Clinton chipped in and said the same thing. And then this one, Senator Portman, I think, whose son turned out to be a homosexual, then he decided it's okay because his son did it. And this type of thing, they're jumping in to homosexual marriage. Some of you saw the little event they had on the Fox News, and there have been articles about it on the internet. I've asked my son, I should ask him again to get it to me in writing, but it's as horrible describing this doctor up here that has performed apparently thousands of abortions and on children that were still alive. And some of the nurses were crying, telling how this little baby was on the table. They, they took the little baby prematurely to, to, and thought they'd killed it, and it was not killed, it was moving around, and then the doctor would snip its spine. And she said, I just couldn't take it. Thousands of little babies were being murdered right there in front of my eyes. They could not take it in our so-called civilized society. The other night on the Fox News, as we listened sometime to Brett Baer, they were talking about the situation, Tahrir Square, this major square would be like Times Square in New York, but of course a bigger geographical area, and how dozens or maybe hundreds of women were being raped openly, all these young men standing around laughing, permitted by the government. This is a political thing people walking by laughing and so on. It's going on all over the world. This is a sick, sick world. And every concept of things that people used to think were sacred, were, were, were decent or nice or good, are now in question. It's a question mark. God said he created man and woman. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They say, no, he created man and, well, we're changing. He didn't create man and man, but now it's okay. A man can leave somebody, I guess, to join another man whose mind, body, personality, character, his whole being was not designed to marry another person of the same sex. It's not just a matter of the physiology, it's a matter of the mind, it's a matter of the emotions, it's a matter of one being created in many different ways to fit with the other, to complement one another. The so-called smart people of this world are so stupid they can't figure that out. Why? 
because they're under the influence of Satan the devil more than they have ever been probably since the flood. And I'm not quoting everything I could quote today because I'd be all day, but most of you know that back in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, some of those passages talk about the coming great tribulation in the world being as it was in the time of Noah. They're going to hell in a handbasket. They're watering down, perverting every decent thing you can think of as in the days of Noah. And we're almost there. We're not there yet. I understand that. We probably have another five or ten years to go before the tribulation. I don't want to make you mad at many old people you want it five or ten days, not five or ten years. I understand that. But it looks like several more years to go. Nevertheless, these things are really speeding up. And brethren, there have been dozens of articles. I know, I shouldn't say dozens because I, mean, I didn't read them all, but I've read several. And if I've just happened to read several, there must have been dozens or hundreds. I've read eight or 10 of them already where people have talked about the analysts, news analysts, the speed at which some of these things are coming to fruition, especially same-sex marriage. They say this is one of the greatest societal changes in American history, but it's just happening so quick just in the last several months, one after the other after the other is falling in line. It could show you how quick Satan can take over our entire society more than he's ever done before in human history. And what's happening right in front of our eyes and you young people you've grown up with and been bombarded, you don't realize it, but I do because I grew up during the 1930s and 1940s. If someone had talked about men marrying men, why well, me and my gang would have laughed them or we'd have run them out of town. We were kind of mean back then, but we would have. We would have run them right out of town. The city fathers would never, ever have permitted that to be talked about on the local radio or TV stations or anything else like that. They would have closed them down to even talk about such a thing as that. And even in the 1950s, that would have been talked about. But in the 1960s, when the Beatles came in and rock music and acid rock began to grow out of that and all the other stuff gradually began to change, and then the momentum began to speed up and speed up and more changes and more changes. And you kids have grown up during the 80s and 90s, you can't look back and see that. But that's the way it's been, massive changes. To you, 50 years is a long time. But 50 years is only a little more than half of my life. It doesn't seem like a long time to me. me and it certainly does not seem like a long time to God Almighty. These things are happening quickly, and it's all under the influence of Satan the devil, and it's all part of a great rebellion against every concept of decency far beyond what most people realize. So I think we do need to look at this with an open mind. Also, I want to mention before getting into a, 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 too much more, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, Mr. Ames gave me some good quotes where Mr. Armstrong indicated that he knew this was to be a much, much bigger thing than just affecting God's church. But he did not fully understand it. Some of you old people are going to say, well, you're against Mr. Armstrong. I'm not against Mr. Armstrong. My whole family knows how I have loved, I have honored Mr. Armstrong, who is like a second father to me, a mentor who taught me more about the purpose of human existence, more about leadership, world events, travel, all kinds of things like than any other human being. I constantly honor him. I do. My wife knows that. All my children know that. And I think all my closest friends know that. I can't help but honor him. But he himself said, you've got to grow in grace and in knowledge. He himself taught us that. He didn't say stay right where you are and don't change anything. There are brethren among us sitting here perhaps or listening in and then there are other little Church of God groups where men have proclaimed themselves Armstrong followers. And so if I say anything that is in any way different from what they think Mr. Armstrong said and they often don't know what he said because one of them never knew Mr. Armstrong in any way whatever. He said, well, I had, I had dinner with Mr. Armstrong. <clears throat> yes, he did. He sat in the senior dinner one night in his life. 
And Mr. Armstrong had this great big formal table in a lot of his business at party, and I'm sure he's been there, as I have been to two or three of those. And the, the candles were there, and it was semi-dark, and Mr. Armstrong was almost blind. He couldn't see very well. He was like I am, too. He couldn't hear very well. But he would be the grand old man and talk to the students, and they'd sit there, and he'd say, shake their hand going in and coming. They, he didn't know who they were. The next day, he probably wouldn't recognize them on the street. Then this other guy knew Mr. Armstrong, the tall guy, because he said his wife was Mr. Armstrong's secretary. Well, his wife was one of Mr. Armstrong's secretaries, neighbor and never his major secretary, unless it was for a very few days or something. They did not know Mr. Armstrong. But some of us, like Mr. Apartheid and other the older men, spent thousands, and I'm not exaggerating before God, I don't want to lose my salvation. I spent thousands and thousands of hours with Mr. Armstrong. I had hundreds of meals with him. I virtually lived with him and his wife for about three months over in England in the summer of 1954. And we'd often have breakfast together in our robes. Mr. Armstrong and his wife were here. And then over the other side of the corner suite we had, Dick and I were living. And in between was the parlor. And we would have breakfast brought up there and have a Bible study with Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong on the Sabbath. And many other times eat together there almost every night together for restaurants and all kinds of other situations. Plus, back in Pasadena, many times in his home and my home, hundreds of meetings and studies and so on together. I knew him. I played ping pong with him dozens of times, all kinds of other things. I really knew him, and I love him. He was God's servant. He himself always said, keep growing. He would want us to do that. He didn't say you've got to take something I said or think that I've said and put it in stone like the Ten Commandments. It was not the Ten Commandments. Everything he said was not the Ten Commandments. Get this straight. Everything Herbert Armstrong said was not the Ten Commandments. And he didn't say that. He didn't think that. There was one guy and he got up in the headquarters church and he, he said about five or seven times, I'm not, he went on and on, in a sermonette, just in a sermonette, he said, God's one true holy apostle. And just shouted that over and over. God's one true holy apostle. He kept shouting that. About a week later, Mr. Armstrong was hearing that up in his, up in his room on the little TV monitor. About a week later, an airplane took off from the Los Angeles International Airport. I started to call it LAX, but some of you don't know what that means. LAX is the airport out there. That airplane landed back in the southern Midwest, and this man was sent back as kind of an assistant or something back there. He'd had an important key job at Pasadena, and Mr. Armstrong got rid of him. He did not want to be adulated like that man was doing, and Mr. Armstrong is the one that did it. He didn't like what to be worship. He always said, don't worship me, worship God. So any of you have that problem, quit worshiping Mr. Armstrong. Don't wor ever worship Mr. Armstrong. Don't ever worship Mr. Ames. Don't worship Dr. Manale. Don't worship me. Don't worship any man. Worship God. But have the fear of God and what God says in his inspired word and be willing to go by that. Be willing to, taught, be, be, to be taught by that. Be willing to be corrected by that. So I hope you can get the idea here. That's very, very important. Now back in Daniel chapter 12, if you want to turn there, we'll turn to some scriptures now. Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> and in verse 4, as you'll notice, the first three verses are talking about the great tribulation leading into the Resurrection from the dead and the righteous and those who turn many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, verse 4, shut up the words, seal the book until when? The time of the end. So here he's talking about our time, the time at the end of this age, just before Christ's coming. Many shall run to and fro, tremendous back and forth travel all over. And because of that and all kinds of other mechanical devices like the internet and so on, knowledge will be increased. There's going to be an increase in knowledge and sometimes an increase in spiritual knowledge too, which Mr. Armstrong acknowledged. Mr. Armstrong said several times, and I'm sure Mrs. Apartian probably heard him, Mr. Davis and others of you may have heard him who were back there. 
he would say, brethren, there's things in prophecy that I don't know yet and that may yet be revealed at the time of the end. He used this verse and other verses. Some things are not, it's not God's time to reveal these things yet. Is it wrong if God reveals something later on? Is it a sin to grow in grace? Is it a sin to grow in knowledge? I think you know better than that, but some people are blocked in their brain. They think if you add anything that Mr. Armstrong has, you're disloyal or something. That's not what he said. That is not the true Mr. Armstrong. That's a false image of Mr. Armstrong. And that image must not be followed and that image must not be worshiped. And that would, of course, hurt Mr. Armstrong if that were done, if he were here to see it. So we are to grow in knowledge. Does that mean we can throw out the Sabbath, the holy days, all the basic truths? No, we're not talking about that. Brethren, again, I graduated about 61 years ago. And 61 years ago this spring, I was already writing articles for the magazines. And I began to go on and lead a nationwide baptizing tour. So I've been at it a long time. I'm not going to change after 61 years. I guess I could, but I think that's very unlikely, if you know what I mean. Very unlikely. So we're not going to change on those basic things. We've never discussed that, never thought about that. We're just going to grow. Please understand. But turn to chapter 8, Daniel 8 and verse 22. While we're here in the book of Daniel, I want to turn to Daniel 8 now and... Uh, something here that ties in with this. In Daniel 8, he's been talking about the four great whirling kingdoms, you know, the Roman Empire, and, uh, well, I should say the Babylonian Empire, and the Greco-Macedonian Empire, or the Persian Empire comes next, and then the Greco-Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great, and so on, and then the Roman Empire. And the horn that was broken and went into four kingdoms, what we've identified, as most scholars have, with the empire of Alexander the Great, which was divided among his four generals. And out of these four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation. So four different kingdoms were to come following those four different generals, as most Bible scholars understand. And the others have continued on. And in the latter day time, so we're coming here down to the latter time, our day, of their kingdom, which would include the Roman Empire and the final revival we're about to experience right now in Europe when the transgressors have reached their fullness. That's an interesting expression. When the transgressors have reached their fullness, when man's rebellion against the Creator is perhaps the worst it's ever been since the great flood when God killed every human being except Noah and his immediate family. A king shall arise who has fierce features, understands sinister kings. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, probably guided by devil, the Satan. He shall destroy fearfully, shall prosper and thrive, and shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So he was going to persecute God's people at the time of the end, the final one doing this will des destroy the, the holy people and the mighty people, probably meaning Israel, modern Israel that God has given the birthright, and the holy people would be God's true church, which he'll persecute. Through his cunning, he's going to be very clever. He shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand and magnify himself and destroy many. He shall even arise against the prince of princes. He's going to fight Christ but he shall be broken without hand. This man is so vain, and this whole system is so vain, and the world has become so completely cut off from reality, from the understanding of the real God, that as you know it says in Revelation, I'll turn back there, not in my notes directly, but it's good to turn there briefly. In Revelation chapter 17, it's been describing in verses 13, the ten horns, that are going to rise in Europe. And these have one mind, will give their power and authority to the beast. Verse 13, Revelation 17, now verse 14, these final 10 kings will give their one power, their power to this one man called the beast. And these 10 kings in Europe, we're not talking about kings in Timbuktu or somewhere, we're talking about educated, so-called educated nations. The Germans, the Austrians, you know, other nations like that, Italy, 
Poland, Czechoslovakia, other Catholic nations over there to get together, 10 of them, and these will make war with the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. And frankly, that army may include many of us. We've come to realize that we as saints may be in that army. That's another, I don't know if we've ever proved that to you, but that's something that looks like that's the case. We will probably be in that army. That's real. This world, can you imagine it? The people, I've gone to Europe many times and I like the German people. I'm partly German through my, one of my ancestors, Harold Ickes, and I'm partly American Indian, as I said, but uh, you know, those people are nice over there now. They've been conquered twice by us in World War I and World II. II. They got the message, but now this man's going to come along, and when the Germans hear the blowing of bugles and the sound of drums, something sets off in the way they're made, and God is going to use them as a tool to punish his people. He'll use other nations to punish his people, Israel too, not just the Germans. So they're going to start marching according to the drums of this final beast power. And along with them will be millions of people in Italy and Spain and Portugal and Poland, probably Czechoslovakia, these other Roman Catholic nations. They'll get together with great power. Are they out of the dark ages? No. These nations have television. They have the Internet. You travel over there. They're nice people on the surface. This world is being quickly taken over by Satan the devil. And it's part of the most massive rebellion against the Creator that's ever happened since the time before the flood. They're going to literally have the audacity showing the depth of their rebellion, the depth of the blindness Satan is beginning to cause right now, right now, that they have the audacity to fight the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as he comes back. Try to wrap your mind around that. Dr. Winnell goes there every few months. I've been there several times since my stroke. I haven't been there but once. But others of you have traveled to Europe and will be traveling there. And they don't seem like they're in the dark ages. They have better inventions than we do sometimes. They take the lead in certain ways. Educated people, education of this world, and they're being taken over by this power in a way that people are turned away from God's whole concept of marriage and family from God's whole concept of the sanctity of human life, so they'll butcher and murder their little babies. God's whole concept of the sanctity of the sense of women, to treat them decently and good and not mistreat them. God's whole attitude toward all kinds of things. Satan the devil will turn them quickly away from that as he did in Nazi Germany. And they will suddenly have a different mind, a different way of thinking. And they're going to fight Christ at his second coming. Those people that some of you have seen and will see on your trips to Europe, it's not something out of the dark ages the Almighty God says is going to happen in the greatest rebellion against human, in human history. So it shows here what's happening and what's going to happen. Now let's turn back to 2 Thessalonians. You probably knew I was going to go there. Here we are. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Let's begin in verse 1. I don't want to begin in chapter 2. I think some of you have been mixed up because we did not go back to, to chapter 1 as much as we should. There are three things, brethren, if you want to write it in your notes, where I think it's allowed people to be deceived in this point. Number one, we did not thoroughly give the background, and you don't think about the whole background of all these other scriptures of what's involved at the time of the end. Number two, a word, a word, the terminology that's used. And often we have found through the years that something can be explained better if you understand one word. And I'll go ahead and explain that now. We say, as you know, as a church of God, that the word ganao, G-E-N-N-A-O, or various ways they word it in the Greek language, look it up in your lexicons and so on, that word, from that word, comes genesis, meaning to generate, to create. Comes your power generators, regeneration, and all these terms come from that one Greek word. It simply means born, or come to life, or create, and so on. It could have various forms of meaning. We have found, and the scholars acknowledge, that 
Ganao and various forms of it can be translated born or begotten. And the Greek scholars use the term susceptible. That word and its various permutations is susceptible of either translation. It's not that one translation is more accurate just in the immediate word than the other. It all depends on what? It all depends on the context in which it's used and also the understanding of God's whole purpose. And so we say, because we know from hundreds of other scriptures that God's whole purpose is to make man in his own image, that he does want to make us full sons from all these other scriptures we use. And then we see that the word ganao can be translated begotten. Many really fine translations translate it begotten one time and born the next time in the same translation, the same word. Why? Because God has not called them to understand the whole purpose of human existence. Not their fault. They're not trying to be dishonest. They just don't understand. The word is susceptible of either way. Mr. Herbert Armstrong, you say, well, he would never change on something like that. Yes, he has. He's done a number of times. He did specifically big time with the whole doctrine of Pentecost. Did Mr. Armstrong ever change? Of course he did. He changed makeup. He changed the understanding of, of divorce and remarriage. He changed on uh, uh, counting Pentecost and a number of things. So I want you to understand that. All right, let's go into this now. Here it says, Paul, Silas, or Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A little sidelight, by the way. Why does it ever, ever mention the Holy Spirit? It doesn't, because the Holy Spirit is not a person. So he's not wishing them blessings or, or anything from the Holy Spirit whenever he talks about the two persons in the God family. We are bound to give thanks always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast among you, among the churches of God, uh, for, and this is the churches of God, one of the 12 times the church of God's name is mentioned, for your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulations. They had tribulations. Some of them were beaten up and thrown in jail. We're not. They had a kind of persecution we've never had, brethren. I hope you can get that straight. Our troubles so far have been very tiny, very tiny, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. We have to suffer to enter the kingdom of God. Yes, we do. And God makes that plain a number of times. He tries us. He tests us. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And to give you who are troubled rest. You see, we're going to have the ultimate rest in the kingdom of God, the family of God. Peace over the whole world. With us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What's the time setting he's talking about? The time when Christ will come back as king of kings. The world is in a terrible upheaval. And Christ will come back and crush that rebellion. And he will rule with a rod of iron. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. You read about those things. In Zechariah 14, where their flesh melts right off their body and so on, when they're vaporized when Christ comes back, the people fighting Christ. In various passages in Amos and, and, uh, and so on, Joel, about the final battle in the Valley of Jehoshaphat and how Christ comes back and crushes those armies and the various passages in the book of Revelation. Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. That's the timing that this is addressed to. When he comes in that day, that's the day he's talking about, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among those who believe because our testimony among you is believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness of the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 2, which is, of course, the problem chapter, but you need to understand the setting. The setting is the time of Christ's coming. 
when Christ will come with fire to punish people, to burn them with everlasting destruction. Now, brethren, <clears throat> chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken or troubled in mind by either by spirit, some false spirit being or something, or by word or by letter, as if from us, false letters circulating, saying Paul said something when he didn't, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, what day? The day of Christ's second coming in power to punish the world. That day will not come unless, and here the King James says, the new King says, falling away. Now one thing I want to mention before I forget it. Often our, even our ministers, and I have sometimes done this unwittingly, Mr. Armstrong used to say, Many times, I've heard him say it 10 to 25 times, he, used to, he learned a lesson. He said, he, you've got to learn not to assume. He would say it that way. Don't assume anything. Don't just take things for granted. It doesn't say falling away from the truth, does it? It just says falling away. It does not say from the truth. It does not say that ever in this setting, in this situation. But the word falling away in translation after translation after translation and the writings of many Greek scholars is just as well translated. And in this passage, I feel as God's servant that God has used now for 61 years and he raised up this work, I feel in this passage, as Dr. Winnell does, and I think Mr. Ames does too, it's better translated to help people understand it, rebellion. And I've been given some very helpful information from Dr. Winnell and Mr. Ames. And by the way, there are all this crazy stuff out on the internet that we're having a great power struggle. Most of you don't listen to all this stuff or read all these things out on the internet. But there is no power struggle going on. I love Mr. Ames as much as I love any human being on the earth except my wife and immediate family, and he's almost part of it. He's been so dedicated and loyal to God and loyal and dedicated and helpful to me. It's unbelievable. Very loyal. We love each other. We stand together. We intend to stand shoulder to shoulder or back to back to the end. I feel the same way about Dr. Winnell. Some of you say, well, Dr. Winnell is all academic and he gets in his stuff. Yes, he's more academic, but brethren, he doesn't go off and jump in some wrong doctrine at all. He just looks at things a little more technically. He too is very dedicated, very loyal, and I love him, I admire him, I respect him, and I think he and I will stand shoulder to shoulder and back to back until the end of our lives or the end of this age. He's one of the most dedicated and loyal men on the earth so far as I'm concerned, or I would not have him over church administration. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> He's that way. We have other very loyal men here just like that. Many, many others. The other member of the board is Mr. Wakefield. He's been here less time, but he seems to be just the same way. Very dedicated, very solid. And I'd better stop there because then if I keep pushing another three or four, sure as the world, I'll leave someone out and their feelings will be hurt. But all our headquarters ministers, far as I know, are loyal and dedicated and the vast majority, overwhelming majority in the field around the entire world are the same way. There might be one or two bad eggs. If there are, you come and tell me about it. I don't know about it now. They are very dedicated, very loyal, and I'm very grateful to God for that. I thank God for the help of Mr. Ames in helping look into things and figuring things out. I thank God for Dr. Winnell for delving into this and helping us see that this whole thing about the falling away is not about a little tiny church upset that took place. I mean, tiny, it affected my life more than any of your lives. You know, I think most of you know that because of the job I was in. But nevertheless, it was a tiny thing compared to what's going to happen. A little tiny church, only 130 or 50,000 people, maybe only 100,000 adults, had an upset, as churches do all the time, all over the world, and most of the world never heard of it, don't hear of it, never will hear of it. It was not a massive thing the world even knew about. It was, they didn't even know about it. 
one man, one of these false prophets who pronounced himself a prophet, and then one of the other guys, the other great one, shot right by him and immediately became an apostle. He appointed himself that. Then this guy thought he ought to be an apostle too. So he appointed himself an apostle. So now two of my former students are apostles, and I'm just sitting here ready to cry. <laughs> no one's made me an apostle and no one better ever make me an apostle unless God makes it very clear with the fruits these men don't have that fruit those fruits and he, they just made themselves apostles but anyway this guy uh, trying to think what does he do anyway he, he oh he taught he thought that this has to be what happened with Mr. Dukach in the church out there and he pronounced that Mr. Dukach in his first booklet this guy wrote he pronounced him the great man of sin of Second Thessalonians. But then when Mr. Dukach died, that kind of upset things. But then he decided Joe Jr. would be the great man of sin. Okay, so now Joe Jr. is the great man of sin. Well, as you read through these, these, two, these passages, does they, either one of those men fit that? Have they performed great signs and lying wonders? No, nothing like as described by these men here. They were just a little blip on the screen in a tiny little church that virtually nobody ever heard of. They don't fit this at all, brethren. They just do not. And these self-appointed apostles still haven't figured that out. But anyway, don't let any man deceive you. The day, that day, what? When Christ is coming with mighty power, to punish people with everlasting destruction, that day will not come unless the rebellion, that is the word that ought to be here, ideally. The word ought to be rebellion. Oh, let me read some of this from the commentaries right here that we have. And uh, here's one from the New King James Study Bible. Reference to falling away. Quote, the Greek term translated falling away commonly means military rebellion. It is a Greek used word that was used in the Greek language to talk about a unit of the Greek army, I guess, that would go into rebellion. A military term that means military belt rebellion. But in the scriptures, the word is used of rebellion against God which will prepare the way for the Antichrist. And that's certainly true. Uh, the ultimate Antichrist, of course, will be uh, the great uh, false prophet. The NIV study Bible has this reference to falling away, the rebellion. So they start right out saying the rebellion. At the last time, there will be a falling away from the faith. But here is Paul uh, speaking of an active rebellion, they say, the supreme opposition of evil to the things of God. And that's certainly true. Satan is getting men and women to turn away from even the basis of all decent society, of the marriage of a man and a woman, the whole concept of what a family ought to be all about, from the sanctity of human life and go ahead and kill babies. They're going to start killing old people if they become useless. They'll start that practice as they were starting in Nazi Germany. They'll start all kinds of things because they don't understand they are cut off and have cut themselves off from God. And society is going to go to hell in a handbasket more quickly than I think most of you can realize. The supreme opposition of evil to the things of God. Then the NIV translation says, quote, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion. So again, they translated the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. And then the English Standard Version, which is a very respected version, by the way, over in England. The English Standard Version says it this way, quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come first unless the rebellion. So again, these scholars there also translate that same word, rebellion, comes first, and the man of lawlessness. That's interesting, not just sin, but lawlessness. That helps us understand it. Sin is the transgression of the law, and the world tries to play that down. That's what sin is. But that's what the word means there. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So unless the rebellion comes first. So this is what these scholars say, and there are other references. I won't read them all. So here we are. That falling away, excuse that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of sin, or lawlessness, is revealed the son of perdition or destruction. 
So this is going to be a great leader of rebellion, the greatest rebellion against God and changing everything in a way that is anti-God, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Well, there's one God this, uh, who has talked about Mr. Dukach and Joe Jr. being the great man of sin he said, well, Mr. Dukach was because he was sitting in God's house, meaning the ambassador hall out there, which we also called the house of God. That was not ever called the temple of God. And it was not the temple of God. It was a nice building, but he tries to put that there, and therefore that makes Mr. Dukach the, the man of sin. No. And Mr. Dukach had mistakes. He was a human being, but he never sat as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He did not do that. That's one mistake he didn't make, as far as I know, unless Mr. Davis knows otherwise. I don't think he ever did that. He made a lot of mistakes, as we all do, and he led the church off and suffered terribly for that. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul warned them about what was going to come at the end of the age, when Christ comes back with power to point people to everlasting destruction. And now you know what's restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. God had not let revealed to the apostle Paul how long it was going to be. Brethren, you know, we used to think that the ultimate end of the age would be in 1972. And then later, some of us in this church thought it might happen, Mr. Gwynn and others, the tribulation would begin in 2018. Well, it's apparently not going to begin in 2000. No, it would be more like 2015, but Christ would come in 2018. So 2015 is just uh, two more years, and we're not near to have, to having that happen yet. So we, our, our timing is off. The big prophecies we've had have all started to come to pass. But Paul didn't understand the timing either. So he, he thought it was going to be right away from the way he writes. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, this one who's going to turn God, the whole of mankind against God and God's law in a massive way will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When Christ comes back, he's going to take this great beast power and the false prophet who works with them, I'll read that to you later, and put them directly in the lake of fire. The coming of the lawless one is according to what? This coming man, not according to what Mr. Dukats did in preaching an idea of us going back to mainstream Christianity and bringing in those ideas. No, this lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. He hasn't done that yet. Christ has not come back. Mr. Dukach is already dead. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Neither of the Dukachs had any great power or lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. So this is not talking about those who had the truth and fell away from the truth. This is talking about a deceived world which has already deceived, which has been taken away from even any semblance of righteousness which they may have had. And as Dr. Monell explained, our founding fathers talked about God. They had a semblance of righteousness. They weren't as bad as people are getting today, but even that is going to be taken away by this coming evil man. So they're going to perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not receive it, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The lie is going to be the story about this great man being like God or in the place of God, and he's not going to be in the place of God, sitting at a temple showing himself that he is God that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth. They said they did believe it and fell away. See, it's not the people in Pasadena, many of them who did believe it and fell away. It's people that never did believe the truth. Notice what I'm reading here out of your Bible. This is what your Bible says. They might all be condemned who did not 
Not that they once did, but changed or fell away, but they did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this is what your Bible actually says. It does not say there's going to be a great falling away from the truth by a few people of God and a tiny little church that nobody heard of around the world. It's going to be a great turning away of the entire society, the entire Western world, and perhaps much of the world beside, into an anti-God posture to where they make fun of the idea of a real God in the way they think, the way they act, in every facet of their lives. So we want to have that understanding, brethren, and I hope that we can have that understanding so we can understand this is a massive historical event that is yet to happen. Now let's turn to Revelation, if you would, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, turn there now. Here, as all you older brethren realize, at least, I can't cover every historical background of everything, but we know it's talking here about the coming final revival of the Roman Empire coming up. He says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. Beast is a term used for pagan kingdoms or governments throughout the Bible, back in Daniel, Revelation, many other places, rising up out of the sea. <clears throat> and I saw this beast coming up, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. You go back to, of course, Daniel, and you'll see that Daniel saw these various empires and was described like a lion and like a leopard and by a bear and so forth, had these characteristics. And the Roman Empire had all of them. And the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. One head was mortally wounded. And of course, that was the fall of the Roman Empire in 476. Then it was revived under Justinian in 554 AD. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, which they did during the Dark Ages because the Catholic Church was in charge of virtually all activities in Europe. And the kings got their authority from whom? The Pope. They had to go to the Pope and he would crown them. It's a funny story about how Napoleon had to do that, or thought he had to. They wanted him to, but instead of letting the Pope crown him, Napoleon was so arrogant, he grabbed the Pope, he grabbed the crown out of the Pope's hands and crowned himself. But at least he went to the Pope. The Pope was generally understood to be in charge, was so powerful for hundreds of years. And so they followed this beast, this Roman Empire, and they worshiped the dragon. And as you know, he's identified Revelation 12, verse 9, the dragon, Satan, the devil, who deceives the whole world. He is Satan, who gave authority to the beast. This coming beast and the beast down through time over the system is guided by the devil. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? This is not a false prophet, because notice the way it's worded. He's a continuation of the Roman Empire. And who is able to make war with him? You older brethren remember uh, Stalin's famous comment when they tried to tell him how powerful the Pope was. They said, how many divisions does the Pope have? He meant divisions of army, you know, men. How many 15,000 men divisions? He didn't have any, but he had tremendous power. Tremendous power. But the beast is the one who has the military power and made war. He was given a mouth, speaking great things, blasphemy. Did Hitler blaspheme God? Yes, it was just the Pope, it was Hitler. The final dictator is going to blaspheme directly, plus the Pope will also blaspheme. Get that straight there, both of them mouthing off against God. And so he's going to speak blasphemous things, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which would have been, of course, during those middle age years for uh, uh, 1260 years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So at least in the Western world, he was in charge. And of course, the final one will apparently have a certain amount of power, it appears for a while, even over the whole world. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. 
Worship doesn't necessarily mean a religious thing, but they're going to submit to his authority. They're going to do what he says, whose names have not been written in the book of life. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And it shows that he who leads into captivity shall be killed with the sword and so on. God will punish the bad guys in the end. Then, verse 11, after describing the coming Hitler, then I saw another beast. So this is the first beast, the military leader of this coming system. Then another beast comes up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. So he looks like Christ. He's a religious-looking man, talks very nice, purrs like a kitten, talks love, but what's his message? He spoke like a dragon. His message is the message of Satan the devil. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Historically, during that period from just standing in 554 until Napoleon fell in, in uh, 1260 years later, in 1814, you had the Roman Catholic popes influencing the woman rode the beast, as you know, Revelation 17, and they would actually cause the military power to punish people, to kill them, to torture them, and so on, on their behalf. So he causes the earth and those to dwell in it to worship the first beast. So he's turning them back to the dictator whose deadly wound was healed. And he, the second beast, who looks like a lamb, but speaks like the devil, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And brethren, I know you young people especially, it might not be real to you, but your life is going to change an awful lot. I think it's going to be changing tremendously even in the next 5 to 15 years. It might be 15 to 35 years. I don't want to hem myself in, but I do believe that most of the big events will already be underway if not finished within 15 years because these things are speeding up and toward the end, the Bible says suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. So once the thing gets underway, just like this same-sex marriage thing is suddenly changing within one or two years, other things are going to speed up. And they can overtake the world suddenly and your whole world will be changed when this great military power in Europe is in charge and the, our, our government now is trying to cut the military back, it's going to weaken our national resolve, weak our national prestige with other nations. They won't pay attention to us once we cut back enough. It's already underway right now. And then this great religious leader is going to rise up. And when he is right there, as Mr. Hernandez says, he, he just says it jokingly, but it might happen. This man might bring down fire from heaven right in St. Peter's Square with 100,000 people there. Whoosh! Wow! That would electrify Europe immediately. And of course, he's lived in Europe four years, as I've lived in Europe four years. And Elizabeth and Jim were both born in Europe. When you lived there and been around the Catholics, you know the tremendous, I can't explain it, the ecstasy they go into, the religious ecstasy and excitement when they start screaming, Viva Papa, Viva Papa, Viva Papa, and they start crying and the women shaking and tears coming down on their breast, getting themselves all wet with tears. Their God has appeared on that balcony. Many of you have not seen that. I have. That's going to happen again, even more so than I ever saw it. When he brings fire down from heaven, it's going to electrify Europe. Fire down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, in the sight of this dictator who's going to be working with him, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. They would pattern their church government after the Roman Empire who was wounded by the sword and lived. So it says he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. They will persecute and torture those who don't go along with their religious teaching at that time, this coming great false prophet, this second beast of Revelation, who will be backed up by, of course, the first beast, who's the coming dictator over Europe over the Roman Empire as it will be revived. 
You say, well, if someone performs miracles, does that indicate God is with him? No, not necessarily. And you have to understand that. So I want you to turn back with me and you brethren out in the field. Many of you are new. Always remember, brethren, Deuteronomy chapter 13, where God says himself in his word, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he does a sign or a wonder, big sign, fire from heaven, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, it really happens, of which he spoke, saying, let us go after other gods, come after our false church, start worshiping the Virgin Mary, start believing in all our pagan doctrines, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is what? Testing. I've told you that again and again. Understand it, brethren. God has tested me and tested me and tested me by all kinds of situations in my life. And he's going to test you. If you haven't had a big test, then wait, it's coming. If you walk with God, God wants to be absolutely sure that you have surrendered to him and you mean it right down to your toenails. You really mean it. And he will test you and test you and test you. So he says, if this happens, God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So you've got to understand that. God may be testing you by allowing a false prophet to work false miracles, but if that man giving those miracles, doing those miracles, said, go after this false religion, and you proved, as it says back in Isaiah 8, 20, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not walk according to this light, there's no light in them. They turn you away from God's law. You know all the other statements, even in the New Testament. 1 John 2, 4. 1 John 2, 4. He that says, I know him. Well, how good it is to know the Lord, they'll get up and say in church. How good it is to know the Lord. He that says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, plural, all ten of them, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's what the Bible says over and over. That's the test. If they have all these wonderful ideas, and they look like a nice man, and they love the poor, and they dole out money or food, that's okay, but if they use that to turn you away from the God of the Bible and his way of life, they are not of God. They do not even know God. They may know about God, but they are not acquainted with God because God is not living his life in them through the Holy Spirit. Christ is not living his life in them, so they don't really know God. They just know about God. They are not God's servants. They are false servants, even if they're allowed to perform miracles. So don't believe him. God is testing you if he allows a man like that to come along. Don't follow him if he tries to turn you away from the true God and his way. Now, let's go to uh, Revelation. Uh, I think I've already covered Revelation 13 and a half. Let's turn to Mark 13 now, brethren. Mark chapter 13, if you would, another reference to what's coming. Mark 13, beginning in verse 17, in this prophecy, which is, of course, the same uh, Paul of it prophecy Jesus gave talking about you know there'd be false prophets and, 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 and all these bad things happening verse 17 but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing baby in those days notice that expression in those days of these things that are going to be uh, all men are going to be hated by all men for my name's sake and the gospel will be preached to all the world and God's people will be persecuted in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter. God's people will be taken to safety. For in those days, notice again, there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning of creation which God created to this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, the days of the final end just before and during the tribulation, for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, then all flesh would be destroyed, as Matthew says. Then, verse 21, if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or look, he is there, don't believe it. You don't have to tell you, have someone tell you he's over here in a cave, over here behind a hill somewhere. 
For false Christ, verse 22 is the, for 32, yes, 22 is the verse. For false Christ, they will appear like Christ and claim to be Christ, and false prophets will rise. Will it be just the, the coming Pope? No. Christ's prophets, plural, will rise and show signs and wonders. Many different men will be given power like this to deceive those who, or if possible, even the elect, even some of you. That's why you need to listen carefully to what we're saying here. It's possible for you to be deceived if you're not walking with God and you don't study and you don't pray and you don't listen to the ones God really is using and has used in his work to know, teach you the truth. There are people coming along accusing Mr. Ames, coming along accusing Dr. Winnale and me and others of us of being a false prophet because we don't do exactly what they want. Well, we can't do what they all want. We're going to follow Mr. Armstrong as he followed Christ and he followed Christ overwhelmingly. But if we grow on some technical point of prophecy, that's not turning away from Mr. Armstrong. That's doing exactly what he said. If he came alive today, and I saw him after the sermon, said, well, Mr. Armstrong, we have a little bit of an enlarged understanding. You've told us to grow, and, and we've come to understand this more fully. What would he say? I used to be in meetings like this with him over. I know what he would say. Well, of course, Rod, I told you to keep growing. Don't stand still, he used to say. Keep growing. Of course we would keep growing, but not change the basic laws and ways of God. We will always grow in some technical understanding of this type of thing, and we should do and be willing to do and not accuse those who take the lead. I'm not accusing Mr. Ames of being a false prophet because he took the lead in helping us see that we do go to heaven, <laughs> however briefly, that's not the ultimate reward, but we will go there briefly for the wedding supper. Maybe a few minutes. Once we're spirit beings, we probably don't need to be there for hours. But maybe it'll be several hours by human time. Maybe it'll be several days. We don't know. We'll be in a different level of existence at that time. But we will go to heaven for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that's good. He brought that out. God is using him powerfully. God is using Dr. Winnell powerfully. He came out and took the lead in enlarging our understanding. We always understood this man was to come along and do a lot of these things, but we didn't realize it wasn't just affecting the church. It was a massive thing affecting the whole earth. And the biggest single rebellion against the creator that's ever occurred in history, like the flood of Noah, but far, far more people involved that were involved at the time of Noah, a huge thing. So I hope you understand that. That's love one another, respect one another, be glad that God can work with all of us. And we work together as a team. I'm not here because I'm better than any of the other men on the team. Mr. Wakefield is much smarter than I am in, in, in uh, economic and, and uh, uh, any areas, academic things and other things. Very intelligent mind, man and capable overall. But I'm older, I'm the old guy, I've been here longer, I've had all those experiences and God has used me to see the big picture and raise up the work. You say, well, maybe God will get rid of you. Yes, he may do that. And I don't oppose that, our men all know that. I've told my wife that, she doesn't like to hear that, but I'm not trying to make you all pray for that, I hope you won't. But God may keep me along another five or seven years because I could set the pace and see the big picture. But on the other hand, we have very capable men here at headquarters that are very dedicated men. And I respect them all and God is going to use them. And he'll honor us if we work together as a team because we're going to have to work together as a team for all eternity in the kingdom of God. I won't be reporting every day to Christ. I may be reporting to uh, Barnabas or someone I might be, who may be reporting to King David, who may be reporting to Christ. You see what I mean? It's coming down from, in Israel from Christ through David, through one of the 12 apostles. And uh, Barnabas was not one of the 12, so I might be under, I might be under Doubting Thomas. <laughs> Doubt, doubting Thomas uh, made it at the end. He quit doubting. So I might be under someone else who's under Doubting Thomas. So we all understand that. We'd better be happy where God puts us and do the very best we can in God's kingdom and God's government and cooperate and build the work of God and help people while we can. 
So God wants us to do that and to learn those lessons. Now let's turn back to Revelation 17, brethren, at this point, Revelation 17. And here it describes, ooh, I'm going to have to hurry here to finish this properly. In Revelation 17, it describes the seven angels who had the seven bowls said, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So he describes this great harlot sitting on many nations speaking different languages and the inhabitants of the earth, verse 2, were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Her false doctrine has made the whole world drunk, even more so later than today because they're going to take over as the major religion of the whole world. And on her forehead, verse 5, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She's a great church, but a great persecuting church. And then the angel said, Why do you marvel? Describes the seven heads and ten horns she sits upon. And he says then, These ten horns, verse 13, are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. So they give their power and authority, all ten of them, to this coming Hitler. These will make war with the Lamb. The world has gone so far from God at that time that the educated peoples of Western Europe and Eastern Europe will cooperate with many others probably, millions of men in their armies, to fight Christ himself. That's hard to understand. Wrap your mind about that. That's how deceived this world is going to be. But he will overcome them, for he is king of kings and lord of lords. And so it describes this great woman is that great city, verse 18, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Then in Revelation 18, an angel comes down, having authority in the earth, was illuminated with his glory, and he cried, Babylon, the great is fallen. The whole system is called Babylon and has become the habitation of demons. Demon spirits are guiding and influencing that whole foul system in a massive way at the time of the end. A prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all nations, not some, frankly when you look at it, the Chinese and the people of India and their false religions all have their form of Christmas and Easter type, you know, objects and, and things they do. It's come down from modern or from ancient Babylon. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth. This system is going to take over. It'll seem bad for us. We won't worry if we're in a place of safety in a cave in Petra somewhere. But we'll hear, boy, they're really rejoicing. And the beer mugs are clinking against each other up and down the first and Dom in Berlin. These people are so happy. And the wine glasses are clicking against each other and toasting up and down the Via Veneto in Rome and up and down the Champs-Élysées in Paris. We won! Those Americans are finally put down. Those Protestants, the damnable Protestants who watered everything down, we, the great church, are in charge. And they're going to have a big political system and a big economic system. They will be very, very wealthy. They will hate to use that wealth to lose it at the end, I mean. All nations have been drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth and the merchants have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And God says, verse 4, come out of her, my people. Don't be part of that coming system, lest you share in her sins and, re and receive her plagues. So she's going to receive double, as it goes on to say. But notice, it says in verse 10, Babylon, that great mighty sitter, for one an hour your judgment has come. And one hour is going to come down quickly when it's finally God's time. Verse 11, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Tremendous trading system. They will be very wealthy. They'll look very proud. They'll strut around like they own the universe for a while. For a while. But then what happens? Christ comes back. And verse 19, Revelation 19, verse 19 I saw the beast, this coming Hitler, who's got to strut around, and all the people are going to say, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, something like that, just like they did to him, and worship him. And, you know, viva papa, they'll worship the Pope. These men will strut and strut and strut, 
And all of a sudden, I saw the beast, the coming Hitler, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the very God. They have that gall, they're so deceived. And against him who sat on the horse and against his army, Jesus Christ, the Lord God of the armies of Israel, is coming back with power such as the world has never seen. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, this great false religious leader, who worked signs in his name, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That will be their reward. They will come to a terrible end. But in the meantime, we better realize this thing is happening. It's going to be massive. It will be the biggest thing to take over the earth and turn men away from God that's ever seen. A massive movement towards secularism and anti-God. And then it will be a kind of reverse twist. The Pope will come in and tell them, no, there is a God. Bring fire down from heaven. And then they'll go a whole hog into that. They say, well, that's right. We lost religion. Now the true religion comes along. And this whole system will deceive people such as they've never been deceived in human history. Then in chapter 20, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon and cast him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. For 1,000 years, Satan is chained and he, and so that he should deceive the nations no more. He's been deceiving the nations, the whole world. And then I saw the thrones, verse 4, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had be, been beheaded. My wife has pointed that out and got my mind on that, but mentioned a number of times, brethren, not just here. I hate to think of that, but God is going to allow some of our heads to go be chopped off, apparently. It just uses that very term. So we've got to understand don't lose your head and turn away from God. <laughs> but if I were beheaded, I would a hundred times rather kind of kneel down and have them chop my head off than to be tortured and impaled on a stake and burned alive. You know what I mean. Other God's people have gone through things like that. We're headed in some awful times. We're going to be tested. But these things will happen. And I think we better believe that. They will be beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, we refused to go along with that system. And they lived and reigned, these faithful ones who were martyred, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And he says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. And God grant that that is you and me, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. We will rule this world the right way in love and justice and mercy and wisdom under Jesus Christ directly for a thousand years. That's the story. And that's the truth. In the end, we win. So let's understand that big picture. We have a magnificent future. But between now and then, we're going to experience and we're going to see around us at least and to a certain extent affecting us for a few years before the final attack comes on America. The greatest falling away, men hugging and kissing men out in our streets right here, more and more little babies being butchered, old people taken advantage of, women raped, people being tortured, humiliated all over the world. And finally the rigid system will do it itself directly until Christ comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's prepare to be those kings and priests. Let's be part of the team God is using to get out this witness and the message of the coming government of God. Let's want to be part of that government. Let's be part of that cooperative, loyal, so that God can say, this person has been loyal to me. They've been loyal to my government. They've been part of my work, and I will give them a job to do because I know where they stand and God will bless us then and he will bless us forever and forever and forever.